Remember the days We saw purple haze One and one And one is three Hey, hey, baby, what you do to me? to Louisville Late Night. This evening, we're in the lovely Clifton Center in the uh, Crowson Hill neighborhood. And uh, this evening, we're here as a uh, kind of uh, relish of uh, America, that the spirit of America is still alive, and that uh, one thing we do in America is we look at things from many different views. And this evening, we have a wonderful person Amy Goodman, who has uh, been leading the charge on getting a full perspective of what's happening in the world. She's a uh, true leader and a wonderful person, and we can't hear you wait to hear what she says. So get ready for Amy Goodman. As well, but let's go back to that time. David and I have a chapter in the book called Hiroshima Cover-Up. We compare two reporters who covered the dropping of the bombs, an independent reporter named Wilfred Burchett and the New York Times reporter, William Lawrence. After the dropping of the bombs, General MacArthur, the U.S. military, declared the whole area of southern Japan off limits. Sound familiar even today. And so most of the press went off the coast of Japan to a barge to cover the Japanese surrender. Burchett wanted to document, see with his own eyes, the dawn of the nuclear age. And so he took a train for 30 hours and made his way to Hiroshima. He was devastated by the devastation. Never seen anything like it. Saw people with their skin melting off, saw the shadows of people ingrained in the sides of buildings. He saw people dying days, weeks after the initial explosion, didn't have the words to describe what it was, said they are suffering from some kind of atomic plague, a bomb sickness, and he sat down in the rubble with his Hermes typewriter and he tapped out the words, I write this as a warning to the world. It was a report on words, but we are calling for plans to be stripped of that Pulitzer. We have to break the embedding of the news. And then I think of another example going back to World War II, and that is the story of Fred Korematsu. As we talk about the war abroad, we have to talk about the war right here at home. 1942, 120,000 Japanese Americans were interned. In Santa Fe, where I was recently, there's a marker for 4,555 Japanese Americans in turn there, in Wyoming, in Utah, in Washington State, in California. It is such a shameful chapter in this country. You think about the thousands of mainly Arab American Muslim men who have been rounded up since 9-11. But Fred Korematsu, as we're in Los Angeles celebrating KPFK on March 31st, Fred Korematsu died. And the next day there was a obituary in the Los Angeles Times that also ran in the Seattle Times and talked about Fred Korematsu, a Japanese American who said no, he would not be rounded up. Eventually he was caught, they put him in a horse stall in a stadium in San Francisco, then he was shipped off to Topaz, Utah, but he kept fighting. He fought the internment of his people and he took his case right to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he lost every step of the way. 
deeply ashamed he didn't even tell his kids for decades about the lonely battle he had waged. And then in 1981, a legal historian named Peter Irons found these boxes of the documents of Fred Karamatsu. Is that like And yeah, at the computer. Can I have that? Is that mine? <laughs> and you could just unplug it. Thanks. I wanted to read the piece from the Los Angeles.